Uh, yeah, I haven't actually got very many slides. Um, I'm going to try something a little bit different today. So, uh, for those of you who have your laptops, I'm planning to do some live coding here. Uh, actually, think of, think of it as like these cooking shows. I'm actually cheating. I do have some that I've prepared earlier. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the idea is, because there's going to be a fair amount of code up on the screen, that if you want, you can go through the code at your leisure um, during the talk or after, because hopefully the commits will reflect the, um, the changes as I make them. Uh, now, would you like me to write that up on the uh, chalkboard or something? Because I need. It's those two H's that are throwing me off. I think of it as two four little words stuck together. Cole Hawk. Okay. Those weren't the four letter words I was thinking of. <laughs> <laughs> Say that to me, please. <clears throat> basis for this talk is um, the program I was using in my first talk and that's this proxy idea where um, if you're familiar with ASIO code then you've got your code spread out of, um, across many different small functions so this is just to show the relationship between them that after accepting a new incoming socket, we're going to make a connection to some pre-configured remote server. And then once that succeeds, we're going to be running two separate chains of operation here, one for forwarding data from the downstream socket up, and the other forwarding the data from the upstream socket down. And I now need to get some code, so that, that's the end of the slide, so thank you. <laughs> My laptop is clearly deficient. It doesn't have GCC 4.6 on it. Sure, mine. Is that is that if you want that larger? I guess that's a bit, a bit small. If you got one, it's fine. That's awesome. That's awesome. Okay. Uh, all right. So I'll just give you a, a really quick tour of the starting point program. So the starting point is a C++03 program. I'm not using any C++ OX features in this program yet. And this is going to be really hard. It's looking for long time. OK, so at the top level, uh, we've got, we have the server program, which you can see here, for those of you who have done ACO programming before, you sort of traditional pair of functions. Uh, one to start the accept operation and the other which is the completion handler that's called uh, when it completes. The next level down we have the thing that corresponds to the diagram that I put up which is the connection class and I've actually cheated, well I haven't cheated, later on in my first talk, I talked about how to abstract away some of the functionality into reusable functions. I'm actually using uh, a reusable function, async transfer, exactly as I talked about in the in that first talk. And so, if you'd like, you can also treat this particular starting point as an example of how to uh, create that uh, abstraction. So, after all it's showing here, after we handle a successful connect operation, um, which was started further up. We're just going to kick off these two asynchronous operations that are going to run in parallel. The async transfer, and one of them is transferring data from the downstream to the upstream, and the other is transferring from the upstream to the downstream. 
first? I'm sorry, which file is this? This is in connection.cpp. I was w wondering if it would make more sense for you to browse them on GitHub and then you get it in the title and... Uh, I want to be editing them though, as I, I go along, so... Uh, but yeah, I do name my files the same as the class name, so if you see the class name, then just put it in Okay, and the final part is the async transfer operation itself, that's in transfer.hpp. And I've implemented that using the state machine style that I illustrated in my first talk, where we've just got this uh, do read boolean that just says which operation you're supposed to be doing next. Are we reading from socket one or are we writing to uh, well, stream one and stream two in this case? Okay, so those, those are the three components uh, that I'm going to be working through today. One thing I've done in this program is I've overloaded operator new and delete, the global operator new and delete, so that we can see uh, when allocations occur, because that's one of the things I want to talk about. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to actually run the program. I'm going to make it first, sorry. Does this require 4.6? Yeah, it, in fact, it only builds on Mac OS at the moment. Uh, be fr feel free to fork and submit a pull request. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is DSIM. It didn't need it. Didn't need it? Okay. All right, so this is the program started up now, and it's. Uh, um, what I'm going to do now is connect a, just a Telnet client, because it's just dealing in raw text, just as a simple test. Uh, so the client is now connected. And what you can see, this is a new feature for uh, Boost 147. I've added instrumentation into all of ASIO's lowest level I.O. functions so that you can see when they begin and end. Um, and that's useful in this talk because we can see when allocations and things occur. So here, uh, so I've got a print here saying the connection has actually started. And so that means that's happening after the new incoming connection has been accepted. Then you can see here it's initiating an async connect operation to establish the upstream connection. Uh, later on, uh, oh, you also see the server goes back to doing another async accept to handle the next incoming connection. Um, in case you're wondering, these numbers here are actually uniquely identifying every completion handler. So I've actually, sort of out of scope for here, but I've actually written a tool to turn this into a little graph that you can view so that you can see the chain of um, handlers visually. Uh, okay, but then, so this async connect operation here says, this is saying handler one is creating an operation which will complete with handler two. If you look down further here, you say, right, we're entering handler two, and the error code indicates the operation succeeded. And then the um, proxy initiates, it's calling async transfer, and inside async transfer, it's initiating the, the read operation, which, because it's a socket, it's a receive, holds both sides, both downstream and upstream. So if I just quickly just type in some data here. And it just echoes it back, so it's sort of bouncing up through the proxy, it's just echoed straight back down, and now you can see here these early operations completing with bytes transferred, and then the async send operation starting to forward it in whichever direction. Okay, um, don't have to worry about this too much, other than to see in between each of these operations, you can see there's new and deletes occurring. That's because by default, well, all the time, ASIO needs to allocate some book, uh, sorry, bookkeeping structures for each operation, and by default, it will uh, use the global, like new and delete, operator new and operator delete. But as we'll see later in the talk, you can customize this behavior. Uh, now, all right, so that's, sorry, I haven't got much time, so I'm racing through here, but that's. Uh, <laughs> That's the starting point. Okay, so what's the first thing that we can do in this program? Let's see. So the first thing that I'm going to do is, so if we look in, say, server.cpp here, 
Uh, so I've used things like um, boost shared pointer, uh, boost make shared, boost bind, um, and if we look in the connection header file, you know I'm using uh, I'm using boost non-copyable to to flag that as a non-copyable class. So these are all things that we find us find ourselves using fairly often when we're writing C plus plus O three code. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace each of these with the C plus plus O X equivalent. So since I'm in this file, then uh, the the equivalent for um, non-copyable is simply to add deleted uh, copy constructor and um, assignment, assignment operator, sorry, yes. And in all the other cases, really, it's just a direct change of um, the boost namespace into the standard namespace, except for the boost bind placeholders, which you now have to uh, bring in from the standard placeholders or something. Uh, so rather, rather than just typing all that out, I'm just going to use the one that I prepared earlier. <laughs> <laughs> I hope for a Z command line. I hope for a Z command line to replace that. Z command line? Z? Z. C, Z. C, Z. 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 Sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, you can do it on most of it, but not the, <laughs> not everything. Uh, okay, so uh, let me just commit that. So use Okay, so what, if you look at the changes there now, usually I should have a faster laptop. Uh, so if we go through example into the connection.hpp, so yeah, we now see it's using standard enabled shared from this, and we've now got the deleted. Uh, copy constructor and assignment operator, and just taking um, server.cpp as the example, we're using uh, standard bind instead. And what I've done at the top of the file is I've just added the uh, using declaration to get the, the placeholder. I don't know if anyone has any opinions on the, uh, the best way to, to do that, but that's what I've done here. Okay. Um, now this program should be functionally equivalent to the previous one, so I'm not going to not going to run it again. the The next thing that I'm going to do is another new feature that I've added in that for Boost 147. That's move construction of I/O objects. Now, not all I/O objects necessarily need to be uh, movable, but I've made things like sockets and uh, so forth movable. They're not copyable, but they are movable. So, in the code as it stands, we have this sort of <coughs> slightly ugly thing where the, the connection class is exposing uh, this accessor to get to get the underlying socket, so that when you accept the new connection. Um, the acceptor has something to put the operating system socket into. But we don't need to do that anymore if we're using movable uh, sockets. So what I'm going to do is change the connection constructor to take the socket object as an argument and move it into its internal um, data member. Yes, um, I, I think that move-only objects are perfectly implementable in C++03, uh, for what it's worth. Yes, that, that, that is the case. I've, for my particular use, I decided it wasn't worth doing. Right? So mm -hmm. the old style is perfectly sufficient and problem. Yeah. Uh, and now that I've done it in C++OX, so I like the, the cleanliness of the documentation of R-value reference constructors and so on. 
So I'm not not likely to go back and backport it or anything like that. If anyone's wondering. Uh, okay. So again, I've got one in the cupboard over here. <laughs> Okay, so now if we look at the connection header file first. See that? So now I've changed the constructor to take the, the socket by how value reference, and you can see that, that pre the accessor that I had there previously is gone. And now also the server <coughs> has changed. Previously the server would store a shared pointer to a um, connection object, which is the one that it's currently accepting into. It doesn't need to do that anymore. The server only needs to keep hold of a TCP socket object. And then once it successfully accepts a new connection, All it needs to do is create the connection object using make shared as it was before, but it's moving the socket object into the connection. Now, in terms of moving I.O. objects, I make a stronger guarantee than the standard does. I actually define the state of the post-move object so that there's no... I think the standard says that all you're allowed to do with it is destroy or is the target of a move assignment, I think that's the case. Uh, so the standard, the language specification says pretty much nothing. The library specification says that the library objects all have de well-defined move from states, like containers are empty. Right. And they just define the requirements on user types to be a move from object. Okay, so sorry, that's a requirement on the user type. And then. I okay. think assignable. And okay. Oh, I've got no. No. Not assignable? No, no, it's that we don't, we don't, uh, as far as I know, we don't, we don't give any special permission for a move from object to be broken in any way. <clears throat> well, but it's basically what, what does the standard expect, what does the standard library expect to do with move from objects? And right, says, I don't it's believe... It's not going to do much with it. Uh, I don't believe that it gives any guarantees about what it's going to do with it. In, so, in practice, I'm it's going to assign or, or delete. <coughs> I'm sure. I mean, I, I'm not sure if it's actually in the FDIS, but there was a paper that talked about this. Yes. And it said, well, we should say this is what it needs still to do, and it can beyond that, we don't care. I, I, I was heavily involved in the design and move okay. semantics and yeah. co-author on many right. of the papers. So, and what I'm trying to tell you is that that I would have tried very hard to stop any anything like that. Okay. So, and and, and I believe that I did. Okay. So. <laughs> okay. Well, at least yeah, in ASIO's case, there is a well-defined state for a socket post move, and in, in terms of this use case, it means you can go and use it again for the next accept, which makes sense. You don't really want to be reinitializing appointments. So. Um, and that's okay. So that's that change. So what's next? Uh, okay. All right. So next one um, I decided to use. If I just before I go, pop into server.cpp and uh, so here in this resolve endpoint function that I've added, uh, I'm constructing this query object passed to the resolver. So there's another feature in C++ which, which I like to save on typing, and that's the new braced initialization syntax. So next thing I'm going to do is replace that Okay, so now go back into server.cpp, and now I'm just doing it all in one line here. Just doing resolve.resolve, passing the two strings directly 
uh, and that picks the overload um, that uh, takes the query object and constructs it with those arguments. So you no longer have to specify the query object name uh, explicitly, which is something people tend to complain about. <laughs> I've also... Sorry, sorry, Chris, can you, can you explain what the braces are doing again? Okay, uh, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but what it does is it goes through all the overloads of Resolve and finds any single argument overload that takes a parameter that can be constructed with those arguments. It's an initialization list much like you ah. initialize a struct. Got it. Okay. Cool. It's, it's very handy. Yeah, um, that is cool. Now, my only disappointment is that it doesn't work with member template functions, um, which means you can't use it with tuples and stuff. Uh, yeah. but, but that's not a problem here. Okay. I've also <coughs> used the new syntax, syntax in uh, the transfer um, .hpp, the helper function that kicks off the operation. Previously, I was creating a named object and then kicking it off. I now just, uh, because, sorry, if I scroll back up, um, I've just defined this as a struct with all of the, uh, the arguments, public data members. And so now I can initialize the arguments directly using this braced initialization syntax and then with the temporary um, are you having trouble? Sorry, it doesn't scroll up. It's anymore. fine. Yep. It's fine, I can see. Uh, and then, then with that temporary, makes the function call on it to kick the operation off. Okay, so what's next? Okay, lambdas, the great promise of uh, asynchronous programming. Um, now, there's a lot to type here, so as you probably guessed by now, I'm going to cheat again. <laughs> Okay, so the the three separate areas where I've applied lambdas, and in each place I've applied them in a sli uh, slightly different way. So at the top level, we have the server, so in server.cpp, where previously we had start accept and handle accept as two separate uh, functions, I've now just put it into a single function on the server which I've called accept. So all I'm doing here is when I um, call the async accept function, I'm specifying the lambda as the completion handler directly, and as you can see you have to specify the um, the argument list, and unlike bind, you can't you can't drop arguments or anything like that. You have to match the signature as exactly as I've documented, uh, because the server object is residing on the stack. We're just capturing everything by reference here, and then in the handler, if it's just the same. If not no error. We'll kick off the connection, and then to go back around and do the next except we just call accept again. So is that is that clear for everybody? Yes. I'm not sure if it's just a Microsoft bug, but um, you'd have to specify this error. Is that what you? Yeah, just let's wait until the connection CPP because that's what I'm wondering about. Okay, all right. So that's server.cpp. Connection.cpp is a little more complicated because it's a class that's using enable shared from this. So for that one, so it's a little bit longer. Uh, when I initiate the async connect, I again specify the the lambda object. But here, I'm capturing the this pointer so that I can access the uh, data members and functions. But I also need to capture the the shared from this. So it's, it's the same as with um, when you're using bind, you need to remember to pass shared from this when you're composing your function object. You need to make sure you uh, capture it here as well. And unfortunately, it's a little less convenient, I think, than bind because I think you can only you can only capture named variables in the lambda um, capture. And of course, the same problem applies if you forget. Then bad things are going to happen because objects will uh, 
disappear when they're not actually when you haven't actually finished using them. In here, I'm kicking off the two transfer operations that run in parallel from down to up and up to down, and I've just put nested lambdas in here for those. And so you can actually see the entire logic of the connection class is specified in one function now, which is it's not bad. So Microsoft, Microsoft uh, compiler 10 would basically complain that you can't capture, that you can only capture local variables, but not something that was captured in the net in the outer lambda. So in the, this point, the capture of the nested lambda wouldn't work in that compiler. I'm not sure if GCC is compliant in allowing that. Uh, I don't know. Um, maybe something else could weigh in on that, anybody? I'm, I'm sorry, what was the...? Uh, the question, so it's, I guess you're talking about this pointer here, the, uh, saying that uh, the inner nested lambda can't capture variables that are defined outside the... Like, you know, it can only capture from the immediately enclosing scope? So it, can only, it can only capture... Um, in, in, in the Microsoft compiler. I've tried something like this there, and it comp basically, basically complained about the nested lambda that it's at this point that it can't capture that. Yeah, I've seen that too in Microsoft compiler. Yeah. So I'm that's not sure if that's a Microsoft bug or a GCC being too permissive. That's odd. Uh, I, the one thing I know about uh, about capturing and, and members is that capture, capturing data members can be very tricky. Um, but but that's not what you're doing. No. So. Okay. okay. Well, so there's an open question. Maybe C++ is only awesome. <laughs> 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 okay. So that that's uh, sorry. That's the connection. Just moving along the transfer function now. Um, I've also that's just implemented in. What I've done here is implemented directly in the function that initiates it. So. Okay, so here I, you know, I do my read, the completion for the read initiates the write, the completion for the write calls the top level function again. Okay, but you see, the, okay, this is not bad, alright, this is alright, but there's a few problems I have with lambdas. Um, well, one is that it doesn't make it nice to express loops. Okay, so the way we have to express loops in our control flow is to have a function at some point that we can go and call again here. Okay, we saw exactly the same thing in the, uh, the server class. The other thing about lambdas, and I know it's not different from bind in this respect, is that each lambda is creating a new type. So every time we use a lambda, we're creating a separate template instantiation for each one of these, these asynchronous functions. So, can we do better? <laughs> So first, first, um, I am going to. Did, did I commit that? I committed the lambda, right? Yes, you did. Okay, I'm going to revert that, but don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now I'm going to do something a bit abusive. And I'm going to do something that works equally well in C++03, and that's using the preprocessor. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, the preprocessor in OX is much more abusable. Oh, is it? Oh. Yeah, <laughs> you get, it's very added uh, macros and everything. That's, that changes a lot. Uh, okay, good. All right, so... <coughs> Coroutines. <laughs> wonder how many git commit messages have WQ in them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so first, first I'm just going to start, uh, start again with the server because that's the, uh, the simplest piece of logic. Okay, so, the, so again I've done three different styles of code needs, all using the same implementation that I've written here. So best thing is to we'll start at the bottom. Okay, so what I've done is I've defined this local struct 
which here I initialize and then I just call using the function call operator. So when we do that, we come up into here and then we're entering the context of the coroutine. And I'll come back to what that means in a moment, but for now, I'll just continue straight in to this loop. So the first thing comes into the for loop, first thing it does is it starts an asynchronous accept operation. What we're passing as the completion handle this time though is the object that we're in right now. And then we yield. And that causes the control flow to jump out of the coroutine. But at, as well, it saves the current state of the coroutine. So what happens then, um, we then call IO service run, and later when the async accept completes, it calls the completion handler, which means it comes back in here, comes to the re-enter, and jumps to the next line after the yield. Now that's all handled for you automatically. So here all that needs to go is, oh, did it complete or not? If it's successful then, same as before, we're going to just initialize a connection object to go off and handle the connection. Then it comes down to this brace here, which corresponds to the start of the for loop. So it just goes back up to the top of the for loop and issues the next asynchronous accept operation. Is that clear what's going on here? So what you can think of from a logic point of view is just that. You don't have to worry about the fact that there's an async operation. You just have to remember to add the yield in front of any async operation that you start. Now I'm going to go to the transfer one next because it's a little bit simpler than the connection. <coughs> okay, so the transfer one, again, it's just a pair of, let's read from one connection, right from the other connection. It's very similar, but we already had transfer as a handcrafted function object, so I've kept it as a handcrafted function object here. When it's entered the first time, which is when you initiate the async transfer, it just comes in here and now it's in the while loop. Now what I've actually done, sorry, when I initiate it, I'm passing in a default constructed error code object, so which indicates no error. So the first time it's called, it's going to go, it's going to go straight into the while loop and initiate the async read sum. And as we saw with the async accept, got the yield at the front here. Time passes, coroutine resumes at the next line, issues the next async operation, in this case it's an async write, code resumes at the next line, and so on. Okay, so again, you don't need to uh, actually think about the fact that the operations occurring asynchronously, you can treat them as though they are synchronous <coughs> operations and your control continues from, from the next line. So like the rest of the code that you, is your continuation and this is your handler. Yep. The same exactly, line, exactly. Right? The rest of the code is their yield. The rest That's, of right. The yeah. That's right. That's right. How is this implemented? <laughs> um, I'm not sure if we'll have time, unfortunately, because it's one very we'll hairy macro. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so connection.cpp, the reason I'm introducing this one last is because I've got this other macro in here. So, okay, first, after we accept the connection, it just comes into this function uh, as before, and here I'm, first of all, I'm illustrating that you, because the re-enter block is this explicit thing, you can put common code that you want to execute before and after every completion handler outside the re-enter block. So what I'm doing here is I'm always testing whether or not the connection has been stopped, because I need to do that in every completion handler, before I jump back into the context of the coroutine. Then once we're in the coroutine, we just proceed linearly, print out the message, create ourselves the upstream socket, then, same as before, now they're doing an async connect operation. And when that finishes, new keyword, or keyword, sorry, uh, pretend keyword, <laughs> here, fork. Now what fork does is it allows you to divide the coroutine into two, and then have two flows of control proceeding forward from there. Very similar to 
talk system call, really. Except one limitation I say is you have to explicitly initiate the thing that does the child flow of control. So in this case, what I'm doing is creating a new connection object that's a copy of the current connection object and then kicking it off by calling its function call operator. There are other ways you could do it. You could do a fork in conjunction with an async operation. You could do a fork in conjunction with a post to an IS service. As long as you ensure that you call the function call operator to continue that branch of the coroutine. Now the reason I'm doing the fork, if you remember from my original diagram, is there are two um, flows of control, one for the up to upstream to downstream and one for the downstream to upstream. Okay, so after this line we now have two copies of the connection object. <coughs> In both the parent and the child, we want to do the same thing. We want to create a buffer for that half of the connection. It's only after that that we deviate into a different behaviour depending on whether you're the child or the parent. So I've got this function is child, which comes off the uh, coroutine class. So if we're the child, then we're running the async operation to transfer from the up socket to the down socket. Else, which means we're the parent, we're doing the transfer from the down socket to the up socket. I could just yeah. say a bit more. Um, so you are forking here, and uh, so both threads will be executing the same code. Okay, so if, that, I, if I just right? jump. Yes, that, that's exactly right. They both continue from the next line. Uh, but, but they know which one is the child because they cannot call this child. Right? Correct. And there's an is parent as well. So that distinguishes them. Yeah, and exactly. what, what is the argument to fork? What is the... Uh, a block of code. <laughs> <laughs> which will be executed. It gets executed. So the parent comes along, hits the fork pseudo keyword, executes that block of code to set off the child, if you will, mm -hmm. and then it continues immediately okay. at the next line, and at some point later, when the child gets a chance to run, which in this case, actually, the child runs first, because I'm making the function call directly, uh, but if this was an async operation here, it would be mm -hmm. sometime later, the child also <coughs> proceeds from the next line. And this code is executed in the child, or the, well, this from, block? From, from here on, Everything's executed in both parent and child. Sorry, yes? Um, do you uh, offer any control over like threading policy and priority? Well, there's before? no threads. This is all with one thread. That's what I was wondering when you were saying fork. It's just forking the code. It's, it's forking the code team, that's right, right. not forking um, anything else. They okay. will be yielding to each other. That's, yeah. that's how sort of multitasking is done. Yield, 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 right? But this is all in the same thread. Exactly. And and ASIO's async operation event loop is the thing that's driving the coroutines, if you like. Now, see, the uh, in connection.hpp, what I've done here now is I've made all three of the data members into shared pointers. So what happens after we fork is that both parent and child still share the same sockets, okay? But, as we saw immediately after the fork line, they have their own buffers. They have their own buffers. Okay, then... Also, so the argument to fork becomes the this pointer of the child? Uh, no. Oh, it's, it, the thing that follows fork is a block of code. It is the same as uh, when you say fork connection, what? he's creating a temporary connection object. Yes, that's right. It's a copy of start of this. Right, but but think fork syntactically behaves like the else following an if else, or a for loop, or whatever. So you can put fork open curly brace block of code close curly brace. It works exactly like that. It's a syntactic element. So the same for yield, in fact. Yield works the same way. Yep. So the fork always first executes the code block that is following directly. Yep. Yep. Which is child. 
Uh, no, so this block of code executes in the parent to spawn the child. That's probably the best way of thinking of it. But bit, in this case, which branch of the if else block will execute first? Here. Don't matter. Doesn't matter. Don't worry about it. <laughs> in, in, no, so, seriously though, in this case it will be the child because we're making the call like recursively to the function call operator. But it's probably best in general not to think about it. You'll give a talk later on, on coworking day. I'm quite happy to go through the implementation. I've already done it with some people. Um, yeah. So are these coroutines, is, is it your own library? It, it is my own library. I wrote it it's in one of the examples in ASIO. Oh. Because um, I, like, I recognize that Breaking up the control flow over lots of small functions is a problem for people, right? Yeah, inversion of control. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Let's turn it back the other way. Mm -hmm. cool. But I wasn't satisfied with the other implementations that were out there because they usually, you well, know, we're sort of running a Broadway pastime. Broadway so. <laughs> <laughs> pastime. Um, okay. So, yes, later we can talk about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so moving on then. Uh, next step is. So, um, Question while you're while you're typing. Yep. So um, one of the things that uh, that I've heard grumbles about with Spirit is that you can't par, par, pause a Spirit parser, say that it's parsing input over a socket. You can parse, yes. parse what you've got and when you run out yes. of input, pause it and go on and then come That's back. That's right. Yep. So you could use this to do that. No, no, yep. you can't. Because because Spirit wants a real stack. This does not have a real stack. These are stackless coroutines. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, we do. There has been work to do that. We have this proposed yeah. Yes, which has a real stack. That's right. But they are by definition heavier, right? So these ones, you you have complete control over the memory usage of your coroutine objects. The actual coroutine itself contains an int and nothing else. So it's like 32 bits of space. Okay. Okay. So before I move on, what I want to show is. Uh, <coughs> Just going back to show the, so just echoing a few things here. I showed this before, we've got the news and deletes between each of the operations. Now I'm not, you know, depending on what field you're in, maybe you wouldn't be very satisfied with that. The actual cost and practice and performance is, you know, I don't know, 5% or something, but you might want to get rid of them, so you want to use custom memory allocations. And the next step that I'm going to do is to introduce a custom memory allocator. <coughs> Again, this is still available in C++ 03 with ASIO, but you need to hook it for each completion handler type. And because I'm using a coroutine, I've dramatically reduced the number of completion handler types, so you don't have to hook it in very many places. Okay, so. <coughs> Six and now I won't go into the details of how the actual custom memory allocation is um, hooked because that's covered in the docs and you can talk to me afterwards. But what I do want to show, though, is in the connection header in the class, so I, I went and wrote a little, little allocator class to wrap the actual mechanism of allocation. And so I'm storing that in a shared pointer member in the connection. And what this means, to get, to get maximum efficiency, what we really want to do is have a separate allocator per chain of operation. Because what ASIO will let you do then is recycle the same block of memory over and over and over again for every operation. So what I do in the connection class, so when I first enter the connection class, I create an allocator. And that will be used for the async connect operation. Then, once I fork to create the separate parent and child, I want to give a separate allocator to the child. So the, from that point on, the parent continues using the same allocator as before, and the parent 
uh, sorry, the child is using its own. So just to demonstrate quickly, Okay, so we'll run the proxy again, and we'll connect. Now, there's still, obviously there's going to be some allocations when the connection is first established, because there's creating the allocator itself, there's the buffer and a few other things. But, <coughs> the next block, there are no allocations at all in that block. Okay, you can just see there's a bunch of async operations running and there's no allocations occurring in between. The deallocations will only occur when we actually tear down the connection, which I'll do here. And there you can see they're all cleaned up now. Okay, so this way we're only incurring the cost of allocation when a new connection is established, only paying the cost when it's terminated. You can take this further, if you remember from my first talk I was talking about, good principle being to extend the chains of operations for as long as they can be. Uh, if you can, and you can, in certain domains you can, extend the chain of operations to uh, the entire length of the program, and so you might be able to do that if you say, I'm only going to handle uh, 100 connections in maximum. I'm never going to allow more than 100 connections. This means you can allocate all of those objects up front and never ever pay any cost to do with memory allocation until the program shuts down. Okay, so the next step. So you've done that, but you're still not quite satisfied. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason you're not satisfied is the handler copying, and in particular this is because our handler is quite heavy it contains a bunch of shared pointers. Okay, and the shared pointers, every time they're copied, there's a reference count up, there's a reference count down. You know, there's a whole lot of this going on. Okay? So the first thing I'm going to do, very quickly, uh, I've, all I've done here is... Um, I've just added a, an explicit copy constructor to the connection class so that I can print out when it occurs, so that we can see the copy is actually happening. Okay, so... So I've just established a new connection. Ah, oh, here we go. All right, so we can see some copies occurring up here. And let's just type some stuff in. All right, now you can see between each of the operations, there's actually this copying occurring here. And there's actually more for the right operations because I'm using one of ASIO's composed operations. Um, and so there's an extra level of abstraction in there and that occurs yet another copy. So in the past, what I recommend people do if they're actually sensitive, like if this is a performance problem for them, then they should make their handlers as small and lightweight as possible, typically just a pointer to a class. Right? And so they do their lifetime management some other way, not using shared pointer, and they uh, just keep the objects as small and as cheap to copy as possible. Okay, but that wouldn't make C++ or X the awesomest, would it? <laughs> so what can we do? Well, we've got this fancy new thing in C++ or X, which I've already used, which is move construction. So what I'm going to do now is copy over the next step. Okay, so now 
I only need to do this for the connection because for the server class we're already using like that lightweight pointer approach. Okay, so for the connection class, now whenever we initiate an async operation, we are now moving the object we're in into the operation. Okay, because we know that the, the flow of control for this, okay, now we, we need to sort of divorce the flow of control of the coroutine from the actual real on the stack function that we're in. The flow of control doesn't continue past this point in the real stack function, it only continues in the coroutine. So we're going to move all of the state into the completion handler so that it comes out the other end when we resume the coroutine. Okay, now, it's not quite that simple, unfortunately. <laughs> If we look now at the transfer implementation, which I've also done using move. So, for move to work correctly, it has to be done at every layer. Because if at any layer I'm not using move, then you're going to end up with the, uh, the copy. So this guy's doing his move. But the initiating function, I remember Dave was asking about this in my first talk uh, when I brought it up. I have to specify this as an R value reference parameter. It's actually using perfect forwarding. Now, it's a very important reason for this, and that is that the order of evaluation of function arguments is unspecified. Okay, so if we went back, if I if I was copying that handler type by value there, then back in connection.cpp, we already do this. Those arguments can be evaluated in any order. And in fact, what happens with GCC is that it's evaluated in reverse order. And so it performs, I'm actually lucky that I tested this with GCC. <laughs> it performs the move first. Okay? Which means when it comes to doing these arguments, they're gone. They're gone. You get a crash. Boom. <laughs> okay? So that's why if you're going to move enable your. Um, your abstracted functions like async transfer, then you need to do this little trick of doing the perfect forwarding of the handler argument and only doing the move out of it at the next layer down. So you ensure all the arguments are evaluated prior to the handler being moved. And I've gone, done this throughout uh, ASIO to make sure this is the case. There's something awful about this, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, so what you're, what you're, doing is passing, you're passing uh, things that you have to access through the object that you're actually going to move. Yep. Yep. But by doing this, this R value reference thing throughout ASIO, that works. Guarantee. Right? I guarantee I will not move from your object until you're inside the async function call, so all your other arguments are available first. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, moving along. <laughs> well, we're, we're way past time, right? Uh, did I commit that? Somebody tell me, did I commit that? Yes. Okay, so now I'm just going to run this. You shouldn't have Sorry? That's SSD, that's why it's good to work. Alright, so now we'll run our program. We'll connect our client. Oh, before I type some stuff in. So as before, as I said, allocations occur up front. We still have some copies up front because we're doing things like we're forking in that. So we're still going to have some copies occur in this case. But if we now go here and type in some stuff, no copies, zero copies. In fact, for as long as that connection runs, there will be no reference counting occurring at all. Okay, so that's that's more or less what I want to cover. There's just one more step. <laughs> <laughs> and I know we're all getting a bit, you know, hungry and stuff, but if you bear with me. Um, step eight. And this is the just because I can step. <laughs> I think you already did that one. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was step four. <laughs> No, believe me, it wasn't. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, okay. 
think I just removed. I need to remove connection and transfer. So what I've done here, this program is not that complicated, so I've implemented the entire program in one coroutine. <laughs> and that's, that's the server. Okay? And so we'll start here. Start at the top. Okay, so we start, first thing the, pro the server needs to do is it needs to run the I.O. servers. And you can actually think there are two separate chains of control here. There's the chain of control that's going to run the I.O. service and block until it finishes. And then there's the chain of control that actually runs the server, performs the async accept operations. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fork the server. And the parent is going to have the responsibility for running the I.O. service. But the child will just, it's called immediately, just resumes from this point and jumps down to here. The first loop is very similar to uh, what we saw before. So now, of course, all of the data members, sorry if I just scroll up for a moment, all of the data members in this class, HPP, they're practically all shared pointers. There's one that isn't, because I don't need to be able to modify its value, I just copy it. But yeah, so just about everything there is a shared pointer now. Okay, so, so yes, first loop, accepts the connection, but whenever it successfully accepts the connection, Erico says, successful. Forks a new copy of the coroutine to handle the child, and then goes, while as parent, go back round. Okay, so you can think the parent never exits that loop. <laughs> only, child, only child forks come out here. The, the next parent. The next part. The first, the first parent is up there running out of Sorry, yes, yeah, there are multiple parents. Grandchildren. <laughs> Those are grandchildren. No, there's one. There's only one parent. No, there was one for the Oh, you mean the child? The that initial child may be yeah, the parent of yes. another thing. Okay. okay and there's so no one. race with the uh, I/O service run having no no task tasks. Well, no, it does have a task because when I call fork here, I recursively call the function call operator on the copy. So that means that the child actually runs before the parent in that case. All right, so it's going to create. It had to finish before the parent would call. It gets down to this line, the yield async accept before the parent. And that makes sure there is actually work for the, uh, for the parent. That's <laughs> obvious. <laughs> okay, so the first thing you need to do when you're the child is you need to allocate the new allocator, same as before. Each flow of control, I'm giving a separate allocator. Then we just need to make the. the New socket for the upstream connection, and we do the asynchronous connect. All this is the same as before. Then, exactly the same as before, if we successfully connect, we fork the coroutine, create a new buffer for both forks, and then we have this is child. But I've done it a little different here because I'm not using the async transfer. All I'm saying is if I'm the child, I give it the same allocator, and I swap the sockets. <laughs> Okay. I'm thinking you just shouldn't have. <laughs> <laughs> and then after that, this is more or less the same loop that we saw before in the async transfer. And that's this while loop here, just yield, while it reads, if not error, writes, so on. Keeps going through that until an error occurs. And then in both forms after an error, it shuts everything down. Now this program, exactly the same as the other one. In the steady state, you've got to connect, long lived connections, no memory allocations, no reference counting. Like, it's about as close as you can get, I think, to the bare metal modulo and stuff that's happening for you in ASIO. And yet, we're still using SharePointer. We've still got all the advantages of having our objects cleaned up for us automatically. We don't have to 
manually control their lifetimes. Yep. So do you have to use shared pointers, or would you rather, could you use union pointers? Uh, okay, the ASIO handlers, I still require copyability. It's just that uh, I don't use, don't actually copy the script. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm a bit afraid of allowing move-only handlers, and I'm willing to take that offline, because there's certain use cases that I, I think it might make things more error prone that this stuff might crash more often and stuff if I do that. So I still require copyability, it's just that in the implementation as it is right now, in a single threaded case, no copies occurring. So yeah, uh, yes Dave? The, the shared pointers and, and all of that stuff does add a significant amount of complexity to the system. The fact that you're not that you're not taking advantage of, of it at all makes me wonder if there if there should be some way to do this with like... But I am taking advantage of it. I am, because I've got two flows of control running asynchronously to each other. They could end at any time, right? So both flow of control, each flow of control has its own sense of ownership on that shared object. So, yeah, that basically sums it up. So, to answer my question, of why the C++ release the awesome. so I think there's one feature that sums it up for me, and that's move. I, I thought you were going to say preprocessor. <laughs> <laughs> so that's not new in C++ <laughs> Yet. Yep. So real quick, uh, yeah, some of us in the back here are uh, determined that we are going to hold you to your your promise to discuss coroutines in yeah, more detail. Have a local, local so uh, there, there are alcoves available in the other building, and so let's discuss over lunch when exactly we want to do that, and yep. uh, listen for an announcement at the start of the 2.30 sessions, if you're interested in that, about where exactly that's going to occur. Actually, I'll tell you what, if there's time, I'm also going to give a quick tour of the new features for 147, because it's a very long list, so if people are interested in that too, then... Uh, it just depends on which, which session you want to forego and talk instead. Um, we'll talk over lunch. Yep. Okay. Yes. Thank you.